Uh, good morning. Today's hearing addresses a key program in increasing public safety and protecting the safety of first responders. The fire grants helps fire departments across the country increase their capabilities to fight fires, respond to medical emergencies, handle disasters, and better confront all that is asked of modern fire and service. The authorizations for the assistance of, for firefighter grants program for the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response or the SAFER program are both facing expirations. These grant programs provide funding for local fire departments, ones in every state and every district, to obtain equipment and training and to increase their ranks of firefighters. The fire grants were created to help local communities keep up with the needed manpower and equipment to handle the increasing array of tasks falling to local fire departments. The growing duties include emergency medical services, fighting fires at the wildland urban interface, and serving as first responders to terrorist attacks and natural disasters. In this economy, maintaining the equipment, training, and personnel safety to and safe, excuse me, and safely respond to all calls is increasingly difficult or impossible in many jurisdictions. Fire departments around the country have been forced to lay off firefighters and forego needed equipment and training. Therefore, the over six billion dollars of grants that have gone to fire departments since 2000 have been integral to maintaining public safety in many communities. This year and last year, fire departments in my district in New Mexico have benefited from a half a million dollars of this funding. Fire remains a serious problem in the U.S. More people die in fires in the U.S. than from all other natural disasters combined. On average, 3,700 citizens die in structure fires each year, and over 100 firefighters are killed in the line of duty. In addition to these fatalities, there are thousands of injuries and over $10 billion in property loss each year. Fires are often a surprise to their victims, but the statistics tell us that fire fatalities and injuries are not random. Demographic shape who is most likely to die in fires. Vulnerable populations, like the poor, the elderly, suffer the most. Males are more likely to die than females, and the minorities, and those without a high school education. I hope that witnesses today will offer insight on why fires disproportionately affect these individuals and how these trends can be changed. I would also like to learn today how we can improve upon the contribution fire grants make to public safety and the safety of first responders. I hope the witnesses will offer insight on the best balance to serve the needs of fire departments and the populations they protect. And I hope to learn how any proposed changes would affect the fire service. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today, and I now would like to recognize Representative Smith for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding the hearing today to discuss reauthor reauthorization of the Department of Homeland Security's Firefighters Grants Program. I want to welcome all of our witnesses and thank you for coming here today to testify on these essential programs. I especially want to thank uh, Mr. Ed Carlin. Uh, for uh, coming all the way from rural Nebraska, the Spalding Rural Volunteer Fire Department, uh, obviously located in the 3rd District of Nebraska. And I appreciate your willingness to share and certainly for your service to our community, our state, and uh, certainly our nation. The Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program and the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, uh, SAFER, uh, the acronym SAFER Program, uh, both provide much needed assistance to fire departments across our country. In rural areas, many communities rely upon all volunteer departments to respond to fires and other emergencies. The equipment needed to fight fires and save lives and properties is costly and requires departments to have certain minimum response capabilities, regardless of whether they are protecting a community of a few thousand people or a large city of a few hundred thousand people. Acquiring these capabilities are particularly difficult in many small community communities that do not possess the financial resources necessary to provide adequate support to these departments. As such, firefighter grants have proven absolutely vital for rural and volunteer fire departments that have small tax bases and the least ability to acquire such equipment. In numerous discussions with fire chiefs and firefighters in my district, the AFG program is frequently cited as a lifesaver and the only means by which their department can attempt to purchase up-to-date equipment, which requires a significant portion of their budget for their volunteers. Because of volunteer departments' reliance upon the AFG program and because of the AFG program's proven track record of successfully awarding grants through an open competitive process based on need, I am concerned about the United Fire Service's proposal to, to transition away from this model to one where statutory set-asides limit program flexibility based on department type. I fear this redistribution of AFG funds will put many rural and all-volunteer departments at a severe disadvantage when it comes to obtaining the necessary equipment. Similarly, also worrisome to me is a proposal to provide priority to applicants with higher call volume and population. 
Volunteer departments serving predominantly rural areas benefit tremendously from firefighter assistance programs because, unlike many other agency programs, the grants are distributed on need rather than population. Population and call volume isn't the only determinant need of, uh, determinant of need, and we must, rec we must be cognizant of the unique role of firefighters, the volunteer firefighters play in serving their communities and not limit an extremely critical source of funding for their departments. I'm ex I am extremely appreciative of the services all brave firefighters provide on behalf of our nation's citizens, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on this very essential program. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. It is my pleasure to introduce our first witness panel. Uh, our friend, Congressman Bill Pascrell, is a U.S. representative from the 8th District of New Jersey. Mr. Pascrell, you'll have five minutes for your spoken testimony, and your written to testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. Congressman Pascrell, please begin. Thank you. Uh, my friend from uh, New Mexico, uh, and the ranking member, Mr. Smith. I want to thank uh, also, of course, our chairman, David Wu, and uh, Bart Gordon, the full committee chair. Uh, it seems like a lifetime, but this legislation, uh, I had introduced this legislation in the 106th Congress. Uh, that's when it passed. It passed before 9-11, and it passed because so many firefighters, both career and volunteer, came to Washington knowing that this legislation was a bottom-up piece of legislation unheard of before, with two or three signatures on it for a year and a half, and then probably more signatures when it passed than any other bill that, that that's a term. And it was passed in 2000. Million, billions of dollars, of course, have been competitively bid for. By every estimation, this is either the first or second best federal program in the whole government. And I think it's an important because the peers, the firefighters themselves, make the judgment. Bureaucrats are not involved. And I think this is why the program has been so successful, Mr. Chairman. And it really was the inspiration for the second piece of legislation, which is not before you today, which I ask also that you reauthorize, and that's the SAFER bill. When I teamed up with Congressman Bollard from Cooperstown, New York, who's no longer with us, uh, retired, uh, and we passed the SAFER bill, which helps the personnel in many of our fire departments, particularly at a time when our economy is feeling a tremendous amount of pressure, and communities cannot respond as they should. Now, when we looked at this in the later, the latter uh, 90s, it was quite obvious from the firefighters that I assembled, both volunteer, uh, career, and retired, it became very obvious that there were a tremendous amount of needs out there, and who better could define those needs but firefighters? Gee, that was something new on Capitol Hill. Let's go to the source of the problem. Let's go to the pro the, those folks who have to deal with the situation every day. And when you look at the federal responsibility and the response to the very needs, you would see that that was a part of public safety that was tremendously neglected. Federal government had re relatively little input uh, into re helping communities respond to the fire needs. That's why the Fire Act uh, w was passed. Uh, these brave firefighters are on duty every day. Um, we saw what happened uh, in 9-11 when so many lost their lives responding. They are our first responders. They respond faster and quicker than the federal government. These are in our communities all throughout the United States. Yet we know that there were communities in this country where they, relative, they had to push the apparatus, the fires. We were very careful when we shaped this legislation that it not become top-heavy in any area, that rural areas, suburban areas, and urban areas, we would balance whatever the legislation would be. And I think 
those firefighters who had acted in uh, reviewing and analyzing 3,000 applications that come in every year, and finally uh, making the decision as to which departments show the greatest need. We've uh, extended, and I want to compliment uh, FEMA for helping put together uh, sessions throughout the country so that firefighters and those who do the grant writing can come to these sessions and learn how to fill out a grant, because that's three quarters of the battle. And I really, they've done a terrific job. They've really done a sensational job. So the FIRE Act was passed and officially established through Title 17 uh, and actually became part of the National Defense Authorization Act. So since 2001, the program has responded to the needs of such as infrared cameras, personnel, uh, personnel protective gear, hazmat detection devices, fitness programs, saved firefighters' lives. Many of these firefighters never went through a physical or hadn't taken periodic physicals. Saved lives. My own district, I could give you specific examples. That's important. We want healthy people going online. We want people that are able to do the physical work that's necessary to protect us to be able to do that. And of course, interoperable uh, communication systems. So we know that this uh, competitive uh, grant process has worked. Um, I would put it against any such competitive process in the entire federal government, not just in Homeland Security, but in the entire federal, um, federal government. Uh, together, as I said, with the Fire and Safer, uh, make up what we commonly refer to as the fire grant programs. Uh, the po I want to make here again, Mr. Chairman, is that the fire grant programs are vital and are as vital and necessary today as the day we pass them. In fact, if when you look at the applications uh, that are coming to uh, FEMA, and when you see what the needs are, you'll see things haven't changed dramatically, really, in those uh, 10 years. Those 10 years they haven't really changed that dramatically, even after 9-11. Today, in the midst of a terrible economic recession, localities throughout America are being forced to cut budgets, and unfortunately, public safety is the first to go. 60% of fire departments do not have enough self-contained breathing apparatus to equip all firefighters on a shift. 48% of fire departments do not have enough personnel, alert, safety systems, devices to equip all emergency responders on a shift. 65% of fire departments do not have enough portable radios to equip all emergency responders on shift. Eight years after 9-11, that's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. Less than 20 percent of the fire departments in the United States are able to cover the cost of apparatus replacement through their normal budget. I mean, how many pancake breakfasts do you need to have to buy a $600,000, $700,000 piece of equipment? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the same can be said for the, the safer grants. I come here today to state that there's one thing we do agree upon, and that is it is essential that we reauthorize both the fire and safer grants in the 111th Congress. Clearly, adjustments must be made to both programs, the next reauthorization, based on the lessons we have learned. We've made those some adjustments in the past by changing and uh, minimizing the amount of matching money uh, from the local communities. And I think that's been particularly helpful to a lot of communities who couldn't uh, Make the, make the nut. So I want to thank you for allowing me to testify. This is in my bone marrow. Uh, I'm available for questions. And uh, you want to ask any questions, ask them. Thank you very much, Mr. Piscrell. If none of the members have any questions, uh, Mr. Piscrell, you're now excused. Thank you very thank much, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Thank you. And we'll now take a short break before our next panel.
Okay, good morning. At this time, I'd like to introduce our second panel. Mr. Timothy Manning is the Deputy Administrator of the National Preparedness Directorate at the Federal Emergency Management Agency of the Department of Homeland Security and comes from the great state of New Mexico, most recently as the Director of our Homeland Security Department. Thank you for being here, Mr. Manning. Chief Jeffrey Johnson is the first Vice President of the International Association of Fire Chiefs and the Chief of the Tuliton, did I get that correct, Chief? Valley Fire, Fire and Rescue. Chief Jack Carriger is the Staten, Oregon Fire District First Vice Chairman of the National Volunteer Fire Council. Mr. Kevin O'Connor is the Assistant to the General President of the International Association of Firefighters. And Chief Kurt Verone is the Division Manager of the Public Fire Protection Division for the National Fire Protection Association. And our final witness is Mr. Ed Carlin, who is a training officer of the Spalding Rural Volunteer Fire Department in Spalding, Nebraska. You'll each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all complete your testimony, we will begin with questions, and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. And Mr. Manning, Mr. Manning please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee. I'm Tim Manning. I'm the Deputy Administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And on behalf of Administrator Fugate, it's a privilege to appear before you today to offer the administration's support for the reauthorization of the assistance of firefighters and staffing for adequate fire and emergency response at, uh, grant programs. Mr. Chairman, we at FEMA share your continued support of the nation's fire service. We understand the value of these programs to firefighters across the country and the citizens they serve. Having been raised in a fire service family and served as a volunteer firefighter myself, I have a first-hand appreciation for the dedication of these men and women, and I'm honored to be able to support them in my capacity at FEMA. And as a former state emergency manager, I have a great appreciation of the values these grant programs can add to the fire and emergency services through improved response capacity, increased responder safety, and ultimately, a greater public safety. Our door is always open to these first responders. Within his first weeks at FEMA, Administrator Fugate and I have met with representatives of the International Association of Fire Chiefs, the International Association of Firefighters, and the Metropolitan Fire Chiefs. Our partnership with the fire service is also demonstrated through the process by which each year's AFG and SAFER programs are developed. Each year, FEMA convenes a panel of professionals from the nine major fire service organizations to assist in the development of funding priorities for the coming year and to discuss any changes in the program requirements. And our collaboration and outreach extends throughout the grant award process. All grant awards under these programs are competitive and are based on funding priorities recommended by the fire service and based on peer reviews by panels comprised of representatives from the fire service. Mr. Chairman, reducing loss of life and property caused by fire remains a significant challenge. Death and injury rates by, the fi by fire in the United States are still unacceptably high. Each year, fire injures and kills more Americans than the combined losses of all other natural disasters. In 2007, fires in the United States resulted in 3,430 civilian deaths, 17,675 injuries, and $14.6 billion in direct property loss. And during that year, 118 firefighters lost their lives in the line of duty. We believe that AFG and SAFER programs can help reduce these numbers. We also believe that without these programs, these numbers might be higher. Our data is beginning to show that the rates of firefighter and civilian injuries in communities that receive AFG awards are better than the national average. For example, from fiscal year 2005 to 2007, firefighter injuries in AFG communities were reduced by 6.2 percent, while the national average rose by 6.1 percent and civilian casualties decreased more than 8 percent over the national average. The AFG program provides competitive grants to address the training, safety, apparatus, personal protective gear, firefighting equipment, and firefighter wellness and fitness needs for departments large and small, career and volunteer. Through its component grants for fire prevention and safety, the AFG program provides resources to fire departments and nonprofit profit organizations alike including public education programs, school-based programs, smoke alarm distribution projects for households. And in doing so, safer funding allows the fire departments to increase their number of trained frontline firefighters available for their communities, which in turn reduce response times, increases deployment cap capabilities, and enhances the overall public safety. 
From fiscal year 2002 to 2009, AFG program has received applications from over 160,000 applicants, has made over 48,000 grants totaling over $3.7 billion in financial assistance. Under its component FPNS program, 17,000 applications have been received, resulting in $172.9 million being awarded to 1,829 organizations to enhance fire safety and prevention efforts. And in fiscal 2005, the SAFER program has received 7,500 applications and provided 974 fire departments and volunteer firefighter interest organizations with $406 million in direct financial assistance. Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my statement by again emphasizing the support and respect that we have at the department from Secretary Napolitano to Administrator Fugate to myself, the respect we have for the men and women of the nation's fire service. A commitment to the fire service also represents an ongoing commitment to public safety in our communities and the people who reside within them. We look forward to working with you, uh, with the committee, Congress and the community to reauthorize AFG and SAFER programs. Mr. Chairman, thank you. R Ranking Member Smith, thank you for, for allowing us to be here today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Chief Johnson? Uh, good morning, Chairman Lujan, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm Jeff Johnson, First Vice President of the International Association of Fire Chiefs and Fire Chief from Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue in Oregon. The IFC believes that the Assistance to Firefighters Grant program is an extremely successful program that improves uh, the safety of the American public. It's one of the few DHS programs dedicated to all hazard preparedness response. In addition, the program is well designed to improve the baseline operational capabilities of the American Fire Service. The program has the following core components that assure its effectiveness. The program distributes funding directly to local fire departments, which reduces the amount of overhead and processing costs found in other DHS programs. Every year, DHS convenes a meeting of the major fire service organizations to develop the criteria for awarding fire and safer grants. The process ensures that the program is attuned to the needs of its end users. The program uses a peer review process that ensures grants are awarded based on merit and demonstrated need. External reviews by federal agencies have highlighted the effectiveness of the program. A 2003 survey of over 1,500 fire grant recipients by the U.S. Department of Agriculture found that more than 97 percent of the respondents agreed that the AFG had a positive impact on their department's operational capabilities. In addition, the Office of Management and Budget reviewed the AFG program in 2007 and rated it effective. OMB also gave the program a 100 percent score for program management and program results accountability. However, there is still a clear need for the program. Because of the recent economic downturn, many departments must close fire stations, lay off firefighters, cut training and equipment, and fire prevention budgets. Meanwhile, they continue to face the constant risks presented by natural and man-made disasters. As the subcommittee considers reauthorizing the AFG program, we'd like to recommend some of the following changes. One, that there is a need to restructure the Safer Grant Program. Currently, the Safer Grant Program requires local jurisdictions to make an escalating match with a five-year commitment. In the current economic downturn, many local jurisdictions cannot make this commitment. As a result, there was a 20 percent drop in applications from all career and combination departments with a majority of career firefighters in 2008. The IFC recommends that the Safer Grant Program be changed to a three-year commitment with a straight 20 percent match. Two, the IFC recommends that Congress remove the per cap firefighter uh, restriction, which is at about $108,000 in 2008. This cap does not take into account the high cost of firefighters uh, in jurisdictions such as mine, where a rookie firefighter is budgeted at 70 and actually does cost $76,000 a year. In my case, the federal government's match would run out in the second year, even with a three-year commitment on a 20 percent match. Removing the cap would fix this problem. Three, that the fire grants should, su should support improved regionalism. According to the fire grant guidance, DHS has the ability to waive the legislatively established funding limits 
in order <clears throat> to support regional projects. However, DHS does not reward fire departments that take a regional, take regionalism to the next step and consolidate or amalgamate. For example, my department is composed historically of 12 separate fire departments. We now serve more than 432,000 people in nine cities and three counties in the Portland metropolitan area. To reward departments that consolidate and cover large populations, the IFC recommends that the funding limit be raised. Congress should establish centers of excellence in fire safety research. Currently, the AFG program funds a number of pro projects that are aimed at reducing more than 100 firefighter deaths and, as discussed, over 3,000 civilian fire deaths each year. While beneficial, many of these programs are not comprehensive research programs. Also, their results need to be transferred to the mainstream fire service. The IFC recommends a creation of two or three centers of excellence in fire safety research. The research centers would be partnerships between major fire service organizations and major research institutions aimed at improving firefighter health and public fire safety. The fire grant program should also have a waiver to local match requirements for economically challenged areas. According to the existing statute, most jurisdictions must meet a 20% match, while jurisdictions serving smaller populations must meet matches as low as 5%. Some jurisdictions cannot meet these requirements, especially due to the economic downturn, but still need training to replace uh, training and or to replace antiquated equipment. The IFC recommends that Congress create the authority for DHS to waive the local match requirement for these departments. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Smith, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to testify on the importance of the fire and safer grant programs. We look forward to working with the committee and yourselves to continue these important programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Chief Carger. Good morning, Chairman Luhan and uh, Ranking Members uh, Smith and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'd like to take this opportunity and thank you for allowing me to be here today. And I'd like to also thank Chairman Wu for all his dedicated service to uh, public safety and, all, and his commitment to the, this program and others. Um, my name is Jack Carrier. I'm the fire chief in State and Fire District, which is in the northwest uh, section of Oregon. And I'm also here as the um, first vice president of the National Volunteer Fire Council. And the council has uh, participated uh, since the inception of the um, AFG program and SAFER program in the criteria development and strategic planning of the program um, through the Department of Homeland Security and uh, has continued to be a part of that input, which has made this program the success that it is, that the, we in the fire service can come and um, give input to DHS and to provide the information that is um, used to base the criteria development for the uh, AFG grants and the SAFER grants is probably, uh, as has been testified earlier, one of the most successful things that uh, has happened on this hill um, in many years. Um, stakeholders have input um, that is solicited through the meetings um, since, uh, since 2000 in its inception. And the process is, was codified last year at the AFG, um, during the AFG reauthorization. In addition to consulting with the fire th service through the criteria development and strategic planning, AFG convenes panels of firefighters to evaluate and rank applications based on merit. And based on the panel's rankings, awards those um, grants to departments across the United States, both rural, suburban, and metro departments equally. When AFG was created in 2007, it was the first federal program designed to assist local fire agencies with goals of bringing all fire departments to a baseline to be able to provide a base level of security for the citizens of our country. And then in 2002 and 2004, AFG was reauthorized, and the second assessment study was published in 2006 that found significant progress had been made in several areas, including a 56% increase in the number of departments with enough portable radios to provide everyone on shift, a 33% increase in the percentage of departments with enough self-contained breathing apparatus to provide one with everybody on shift. 
a 129% increase in the number of the departments with thermal imaging cameras and 21 to 42% increase depending upon the type of the incident over overall uh, percentage of departments with written agreements of cooperation with using outside personnel and equipment from in responses to emergencies. In addition to statistical uh, documentation, the program of the program success, there are several available uh, websites such as www.firegrantsport.com, which is maintained by FEMA, and www.firegrantdata. Dot com, which is maintained by several uh, of the National Fire Service organizations. And I can tell you that my department has received several of these grants and has made an extreme difference in our ability to not only provide service to the public, but to provide service to other agencies through uh, interoperability uh, and through compatibility. Our first grant was for SCBAs. Our equipment was more than 15 years old and did not meet any of the current NFPA standards. We were able to um, purchase new um, SCBAs that were compatible with larger departments around us and all of those uh, neighboring departments that surrounded us. Our second grant was to receive personal protective equipment, which included helmets, turnouts, boots, and gloves, which um, replaced equipment that was 15 to 20 years old also. And this allowed us to not only be able to provide safer service to the public, but to provide that extra level of safe protection to the firefighters themselves. And as it's stressed so heavily in the fire service today, uh, the need for everyone to go home is based on our ability to provide safety for those firefighters, both career and volunteer. Um, our third grant was for uh, a rehabilitation trailer for firefighters and other emergency agencies, uh, people that provide monitoring, care, and treatment on scene for firefighters while they're working, especially in long duration incidences. The SAFER Act has brought a, a new ability to volunteer fire service to be able to go out and actively participate in uh, recruitment and retention programs that are so vitally important to uh, the volunteer service right now with its challenges of, of finding people that are willing to take the time out of their lives and help re uh, revitalize the ranks of the volunteer fire service in the United States. And we at the MVFC feel that um, this program is vital to the um, future of the fire service in general and that um, both SAFER and AFG are uh, vital to the future of our ability to provide first line, first response service um, to the communities that we serve, which um, is equal across the nation, no matter what size the department is. And at NVSC, we'd like to see um, some things take change in the service. Although we feel that the program is an excellent program, it's designed well through criteria development, through strategic planning, and through the peer, regroup, peer group evaluation, those groups continually bring better things to the matrix process and the application process. But we'd also like to see Congress authorize additional tools for assist, assessing AFG and SAFER. This would include another fire service needs assessment to measure the process, progress that has been made in uh, bringing fire departments up to baseline levels of readiness based on natural, uh, national consensus standard. It would also include developing tools to analyze the impact that grants are having in the communities and incorporated data from uh, NIMFERS. State fire training agencies should be made eligible grantees through the AFG, including grants to purchase of for the purchase of vehicles and equipment. Grants for state training agencies should be capped at a million dollars, the same as all but the largest fire department jurisdictions. State training agencies are a critical component of uh, creating and, and delivering training throughout the country, and especially in rural areas. National organizations should be able to 
be eligible to apply for safer and recruitment and retention grants. Recruitment and retention is one of the most significant challenges facing volunteer fire service today. State and local interest organizations are already eligible to apply for the for these grants and have been able to use the funds to assist hundreds of um, departments. National organizations could use the same approach and even on a larger scale and larger groups of, and for departments. And the local matching requirement for the departments through the fire prevention and safety should be eliminated. This would hopefully re reinvent the, uh, rejuvenate the participation in those programs. Um, as well as in the interest of national organizations which currently have no matching requirements. And I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to participate and um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. Thank you very much, Chief. And uh, Mr. O'Connor, to recognize, just want to remind the witnesses uh, of the five minute timeline. We may be called for votes close to 11 so that way we can get through all the questions. Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, Chairman Luhan, Ranking Member Smith. I'm Kevin O'Connor, representing the men and women of the International Association of Firefighters. Prior to my IAFF service, I served for 15 years as a firefighter EMT in the Baltimore County Fire Department and was also a proud volunteer in that same jurisdiction. Let me begin by thanking this committee for its continued interest in the AFG and SAFER programs. Without the consistent bipartisan support of the Science Committee, neither program would have ever been authorized. Today, I'm here to support the reauthorization of both programs but also to offer constructive advice to make AFG safer, more efficient, and cost effective. In its eight-year history, as you've been told, AFG has dispensed over 40,000 grants totaling almost $4 billion. But those statistics belie the fact that the programs have not always met their original objective. AFG and SAFER were designed to strengthen the ability of local fire departments to better protect safety nationwide. While some communities have used the grants to make important enhancements in local fire protection, it is clear that the funds are not being used effectively and the current statutory limitations are undermining AFG's mission. Recognizing this problem, the IAFF worked with the IAFC and NFPA, who are also at this table today, as well as others to craft a proposal, which we believe addresses a serious impediments under current law that may prevent many communities from taking full advantage of AFG and SAFER. Empirically, the overwhelming majority of fire grants are awarded to departments that protect a relatively small percentage of the population. Since 2002, fire departments protecting only 20 percent of our nation's populations have received a disproportionate share of AFG funding. We fully support ensuring that communities of every size, large and small, both career and volunteer departments, receive a fair share of AFG grants. However, the current distribution of funds, which protects only a small portion of the population, is an inefficient use of scarce federal resources. For a glaring example of this disparity, we only need to look at my old fire department, Baltimore County. There, career units run 70 percent of the calls, but are only eligible under current guidelines for $1.75 million in AFG grants. The county's 33 independent volunteer companies which run 30 percent of the call volume, are collectively allowed to apply for $33 million in grants. Other examples abound and are, are enumerated in my written testimony. By all measurements, this is an uneven and ineffective allocation. The system should be changed. Therefore, we advocate revamping the program to apportion AFG into four separate pots of money, 30 percent each allocated for all volunteer departments, all career and all combination departments, with the remaining 10 percent allocated through open competition. We further suggest that the funding caps be adjusted upwardly. Under current law, for example, the New York City Fire Department, which runs 357 fire companies and responds to nearly a half million calls for assistance per year, can only receive $2.75 million in AFG funding. Under our proposal, the smallest jurisdictions could receive up to $1 million and cities with over a million residents could receive up to $10 million. So the smallest communities would still continue to enjoy proportionately very large awards. By increasing the size of grant awards for larger jurisdictions, AFG could finally start making measurable differences in a larger department's response capabilities. Lastly, we suggest lowering the match from 20 to 15 percent with exceptions to further reduce or eliminate the local portion if financial distress can be enumerated. We concur with the IFC's position in that regard. 
These changes will improve AFG and ensure that federal dollars are spent in a way that maximizes the benefit to public safety while ensuring communities of all sizes continue to benefit from the program. SAFER, the staffing component of AFG, also needs to be reformed. In its current iteration, SAFER requires an increasing local match over five years and caps the federal share at $110,000 per position. As a result, SAFER has become a program that only benefits a small number of growing but prosperous jurisdictions. To truly assist departments in meeting safe staffing and deployment requirements, the rules governing SAFER should be simplified. We advocate, one, establishing a flat 20% match to allow for better resource management, two, shortening the grant period from five to three years to allow communities to better plan expenditures, and three, eliminate the current cap to address significant differences in starting salary, as has been uh, testified by Chief Johnson. Collectively, these changes will enable more communities to use SAFER to increase the number of firefighters, which in turn improves local response capabilities and assists in meeting national consensus standards. In conclusion, the changes we advocate with the United Fire Service organizations will improve both AFG and SAFER to better fulfill their statutory obligation to improve the capabilities of local communities while ensuring that federal resources will be used more effectively to protect public safety. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and we'll be ready to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Connor. Chief Rowe. Good morning. I'm Kurt Barone, Division Manager, Public Fire Protection for the National Fire Protection Association. Mr. Chairman, subcommittee members, NFPA strongly supports reauthorization of the U.S. Fire Grant programs, both AFG and SAFER, and appreciates the opportunity to speak about these programs. For my allotted time, I want to uh, focus on three areas. Research we have done to analyze the needs of our nation's fire service and the impact these programs have had on alleviating those needs some thoughts on enhancements that can be considered during reauthorization, and lastly, NFPA's position on the most effective ways to continue to reduce fires and fire fatalities, and firefighter fatalities. By way of background, NFPA is the principal source for voluntary consensus codes and standards related to fire safety and the fire service. Our standards utilize a true consensus approach to address a broad range of topics such as professional qualifications and performance testing, maintenance, and operational procedures for protective and firefighting equipment. Many NFPA codes and standards appear as mandatory references cited throughout federal agency regu regulations, including DHS, DOT, CMS, EPA, and OSHA. NFPA is also a recognized authority on fire analysis and research. In 2001 and 2005, working with the U.S. Fire Administration, NFPA conducted two national surveys of the needs of U.S. municipal fire departments. In both surveys, needs were defined as the comparison of department resources to resources required for compliance with applicable national standards and guidelines. As part of the second needs assessment, NFPA examined the degree of match between the type of resource source for which a grant was awarded and the department's reported need for that type of resource. NFPA also examined the changes in the levels of need for most, the most commonly requested types of resources. Our analysis concluded that the grant program was well designed, well executed, and well targeted, and has made a difference in the needs it was intended to address. However, the difference has been limited simply because the needs of our nation's first responders are great. Despite this, some notable changes stand out. The percentage of departments with enough self-contained breathing apparatus to equip all emergency responders on a shift increased by 10 percentage points from 30 percent to 40 percent. The percentage of departments with enough uh, personal alert safety system devices to equip all emergency responders on a shift increased 14 percent from 38 to 52 percent. Personal protective equipment accounted for the largest share of grant funds awarded for departments in the years analyzed. NF, the NFPA matching analysis, part of our second needs assessment, shows a positive correlation between the expressed needs and the impact of the AFG program in targeting that need. NFPA, NFPA believes that there are ample data to support the successful initiation by both programs of vital changes necessary to protect the health and safety of the public and firefighting personnel against fire and fire-related hazards. The AFG program is a good beginning, and SAFER is an even more recent good beginning. We have a long way to go to close our national gap in staffing, and we need to continue to support SAFER for several years in order to ensure that it fulfills its objectives 
of helping fire departments meet safe staffing levels to provide protection from fire as well as emergency response to many other types of hazards identified by DHS. These programs can be strengthened in reauthorizing, in, reauthor, in the reauthorization NFPA believes that it would be appropriate to eliminate the cost share in fire prevention and firefighter safety grants as was the original intent of the program, or to allow a waiver or reduction of the match requirement for applicants facing a demonstrated economic hardship. Data show that roughly three out of every five emergency responses by U.S. fire departments are medical emergency calls. Therefore, the NFPA recommends that a minimum of 5% of funding be designated for fire service-based emergency medical services. Finally, NFPA believes that funds for training and equipment should be utilized to meet the latest applicable national voluntary consensus standards. In order to facilitate fire prevention and fire control activities, the USFA could identify specific safety strategies they wish to give priority to in the call calls for proposal. Specify fire and life safety education programs in the listed grant fund purposes and or require all AFG grants to include an aligned fire pre prevention or mitigation project. The USFA could also direct some funds to building the fire prevention personnel and organizational infrastructure in local fire departments. An NFPA research project on fire code effectiveness measurement showed several examples of how lack of funding and other limitations are forcing communities to leave most inspectable commercial properties uninspected. Lastly, the way to decrease the number of fires and fire-related fatalities, particularly in vulnerable populations, is through a combination of education, teaching individuals how they can be safer from fire, engineering, utilizing the latest technologies to prevent, mitigate, detect, and suppress fire, and enforcement, ensuring that the latest codes and standards are being followed. To do this, we need to adequately staff, train, and equip local fire services. Today, we ask our fire service to do a lot more than fight fires. We ask them to be the first line of defense in a full range of, extra of ordinary and extraordinary situations. As we place more demands on them, we must be willing to provide them with the resources to do the job. We know from our analysis that the fire service is woefully underfunded. The fire grant programs are working. They're moving the fire service in the right direction and must continue. Uh, this is, uh, it is essential that the fire grant programs be reauthorized. Thank you. Mr. Carlin. Chairman Luhan, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today to provide testimony in regards to the AFG program. My name is Ed Carlin. I live in the small town of Spalding and belong to the Spalding Volunteer Fire Department, a department made up of 35 volunteers. I also help serve my community as an elected official on the city council. In addition, I am a career firefighter currently serving as captain on the Grand Island Fire Department. Our fire department functions with 68 members operating out of four stations. We provide emergency services such as fire, EMS, rescue, hazardous material response, airport response, and technical rescue response such as trench and high angle rescue. While off duty, I teach both fire and EMS education to departments in Nebraska. As a career firefighter, a volunteer firefighter, and a fire and EMS instructor, I've been able to see the benefits of the AFG and some of the shortfalls of the grant as I traveled throughout the state. I was asked to come before you and give an oral testimony to what I have seen and experienced on a local and community level where I am involved. Funding for a career and volunteer fire department was almost impossible to obtain until the AFG was established. A lot of the departments are in areas classified as low-income areas. Although these designations offered relief to citizens in the area, it did nothing to help the fire departments. With poor economies, not just locally, but across the nation, along with their low-income classification, funding for equipment and staffing was becoming impossible to secure. The community where I reside, Spalding, Nebraska, had this problem until awarded an AFG grant in 2008. The community only had one fire apparatus, a 1948 pumper that could not hold water due to a rusted tank. This tank could not be fixed or relined due to the structural integrity of the tank. When a fire broke out, they would have to park this pumper next to a hydrant and deploy a portable tank so they could pump out of it until mutual aid arrived from the rural fire district. Valuable time was lost setting up this tank, allowing a fire to further destroy property and eliminating the window of opportunity for a rescue. Our ability to protect the two things a firefighter is sworn to protect, life and property, was jeopardized in our community. When Spalding applied for a grant, they opted for a mini pumper for several reasons. The smaller size allowed it to fit in the current building and allowed for a quicker response. 
Once the 5% matching funds was obtained, the grant was submitted, and as stated earlier, we received this grant. The new mini pumper will now allow the village to respond with a reliable pumper to help mitigate emergencies in our area. Obtaining equipment to protect our firefighters and allowing them to conduct their mission in a safe, efficient manner would be next to impossible without the AFG. I believe this program is on the right track of fulfilling its objective of protecting the public and firefighters from the hazards of fire. I do know that we have a long way to go to meet these objectives. It is still hard for some departments to come up with their matching portion of the grant, which ultimately keeps them from applying. I know of a few departments who are not applying this year because they will not be able to meet the required match for the grant. In the profession of firefighting, it is often said that all firefighters are professional and held liable for their duties, whether they are from a career or volunteer at fire department. In the 2009 AFG grant, new priorities were outlined giving higher levels of consideration to departments that protect a larger population and have a higher call volume. This is a highly competitive grant, and this provision alone could possibly eliminate several er rural area grants from advancing to the next round of peer review. I understand the higher call volume will show a greater cost benefit of the award, but the grant should not discriminate on the basis of the population served by a certain fire department. A life is a life and death does not discriminate by population. Possibly they should give a higher consideration to departments by the square miles they protect as well since most rural areas have huge coverage areas. I recently instructed a rural department which I could not allow to participate in any live fire exercises because their bunker gear did not meet the required standards. They were not able to compete, complete some of the realistic training that I feel is critical for firefighters to experience and learn from. If this department was dispatched to a fire call today and had a rescue situation in front of them, I can almost guarantee that not one firefighter would hesitate to attempt the rescue. Not one would say, I cannot go in because instructor Carlin told me my gear is not compliant with the NFPA standards. It is what they are trained to do, whether we like it or not, they are going to do their job and attempt to save the life. Fortunately, an AFG grant was awarded to them and they are in the process of acquiring new gear to protect their firefighters. It is stated in the program guidance for the 2009 AFG that our primary goal is to help fire departments and non-affiliated EMS organizations, organizations meet their firefighting and emergency response needs. Based off this, I do not believe the intent of the grant program was for it to become biased toward the population of a given area, whether large or small. I feel the AFG is not a complex grant to apply for. <clears throat> but many departments use grant writers to write their grants. There is nothing wrong with using a grant writer. It can provide an edge by using experience and expertise in the field. There are still thousands of departments out there that cannot afford to use a grant writer and will continue to submit, submit their own grants due to the lack of funds. Funding for the AFG is right on track. The money goes straight to the fire department and 100% of it can be used at their request. The SAFER program has also been a huge benefit to fire departments across the nation in this time of economic crisis. Fire departments nationwide are being forced to freeze hiring and lay off firefighters. Unlike factories, manufacturing plants, and other businesses that can slow production or reduce their production to coincide with their layoffs, we cannot. There is no control over fires, accidents, injuries, and other emergency calls, and our call volumes will not decline. Fire scenes are demanding and often wire continue require continuous aggressive actions to stop the fire. Waging this war in dangerous environments close to a point of exhaustion, firefighters work as they await other units to arrive and relieve them so they can rehabilitate and return to the battle. At these scenes, manpower is often the primary resource and without it, firefighters will be forced to operate in multiple roles, putting them in dangerous situations without the help they need. In closing, as these cuts to fire departments are made, I would not expect the number of injuries and fatalities to firefighters on fire and emergency scenes to decline, but possibly increase instead. It was evident early on the SAFER grant was needed to adequately staff the fire departments manning to a level where they could safely respond. SAFER funding needs to remain at a higher level at the $420 million, but taking money from the AFG program and adding it to the SAFER program is not the solution. With 21,000 departments applying for $3.2 billion in the AFG, it is evident that there's still a need for the AFG to be fully funding, funded. Thank you, and I'll ha be happy to answer your questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. At this point, we'll open our first round of questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. I want to thank each of you for sharing your testimony today. Um, my district in New Mexico is a rural district for the most part. Um, my uh, familiarity with the important responsibilities that our fire service has across New Mexico 
is one that I had uh, serving in my previous capacity. We were uh, a regulatory commission that was structured in such a way that our fire marshal for the state of New Mexico and our state fire academy were under our jurisdiction. And we worked closely with them in the state of New Mexico to create um, opportunities to be able to take advantage of a fire fund that was put in place at the state level, but that was not being fully allocated to our firefighters across New Mexico and our fire districts, recognizing the importance of being able to get them the support that they need. Um, but the emphasis in our state was to look at those ISOs that were in trouble, those fire districts that didn't have the tax base or the ability to be able to get the resources. And so we put together the fire grant fund to be able to emphasize um, the fact that we could grow those fire departments that were weaker. And as we strengthen them, the state as a whole would be in a better position to be able to protect our citizens, uh, to be able to respond to different areas. Um, I have uh, counties where we don't have many people that reside in them. Um, Mr. Manning's familiar with those. Uh, I was in many of them this last week. Uh, and it's important that we're also able to provide them support. Um, and so with that being said, with some of the suggestions that we're hearing today, how will we make sure that we're able to still fully support the fire needs of all parts of the country um, as we're looking to make sure we're maximizing the investments that can be made? And I would open that up to any one of you. Kevin O'Connor again from the IAFF. I think that everybody at this table is committed and recognizes that there's not an unlimited pool of federal resources. There's no way that the federal government can properly resource all local fire departments. So with the limited pot of money that we have, and some of the observations here I completely concur with, we have to make sure that we spend it efficiently. And I think that when you look at the data over eight years, clearly it's helped departments of all size, and we recognize that, and we think that that should continue. But I think in an objective analysis, as the stewards of the public dollar, we have an obligation to make sure that it's spent efficiently. That doesn't mean that population needs to be the only requisite, which is one of the reasons in adopting the proposal of 30-30-30, you essentially are comparing apples to apples. For our organization, a lot of people are under the misconception that we only represent large jurisdictions. We've got 3,100 chapters across the country. We call them the locals. Over half of them have under 50 people and under 20 percent have under 15 members. So some of the same problems that local volunteer companies are facing in terms of grant writing, we have. We've got small departments that don't have those capabilities. But by our measure, if you can group the money proportionally, all the professional departments are little, uh, in some of the areas in Mr. Smith's district, you have, we have locals with eight people. They will be competing for the professional pot against New York City. So it's not done as large versus small. It's trying to compare apples to apples and make sure that there's a reasonable allocation of dollars. And we just think that on the front end of this, and I was privileged to be part of that process, we were very cognizant of the legitimate concerns of smaller departments. And in crafting even the statutory requirements of the 45%, we took that in consideration. But as time has evolved, we've seen that just the opposite has been the case. And this is just an attempt to rectify it while ensuring fairness and equity to everybody. Mr. Chairman, I agree with uh, some of the uh, statements that Mr. O'Connor and that Mr. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Carlin made. I think it's extremely important that this program be reauthorized, but I believe that we need to look at the fact that um, there's two different issues involved in this program with AFG and with SAFER. And I believe that neither issue is satisfied by robbing one from one's resources and giving them to the other. They need to both be fully funded at the authorized amounts that have been recognized in the past. And as we continue to grow and as the system builds for this um, program, it gets better. Um, and we are constantly looking at ways to uh, recognize how to uh, apply the matrix system for the application process in a more fair way. Um, and I would have to compliment the staff um, for their constant vigil on um, recognizing that there's always a better way, even though this program has been very, very effective and I've been very proud to be a part of it. We are constantly looking for ways to make it better. And I think that um, through this process that will happen, but that will only happen if this 
both of these programs are funded to their maximum authorized uh, levels. And that is what is going to result in providing our country with the first response capabilities that this committee is looking for as a result. Thank you very much, Chief. I now recognize Mr. Smith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess for the record, uh, Mr. Carlin, could you state the population of Spalding? 600. 600, right. So I, I overstated in my opening statements when I talked about communities of a few thousand people uh, right, up to a, communities of a few hundred thousand people and even, even more. But how many miles across would you say your jurisdiction is? I believe Spalding covers about a 350 square mile district. So there might be a fire where no people are located, but you still need to fight the fire. Is that accurate? That's correct. A lot of times they have to travel miles, which is across the nation, miles off the road just to get to a fire, you know. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I do want to point out that I am constantly impressed and truly amazed by the cooperation of, of departments. It might be a volunteer department uh, complementing a, a uh, full-time paid department. It might be uh, one paid department from a neighboring community complementing another one. Uh, regardless, uh, I, I appreciate the, the uh, hard work and efforts that everyone makes to, to fight the uh, bad things that can happen in various communities. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the matching requirement. Uh, the U, uh, Unified Fire Service proposal recommends reducing the current matching requirement for large departments from 20% down to 15% and increasing the matching for small departments up to 15% from its current level of 5%, basically tripling that. Uh, Mr. Carriger, Mr. Carlin, uh, could you discuss how the rural departments you represent currently deal with the match requirement and how this increase would impact uh, your ability to apply and receive the grants? Uh, that coming up with the 5% is hard for many departments to do. In the regional grants, they add the population of everyone going together in the grant, and it'll usually take you up to the 10% match, and that's preventing a lot of the departments in our area from applying for a regional grant because it brings them up to the 10% and they just can't meet that requirement. So a 15% match would definitely eliminate several departments from even applying. Mr. Smith, I would have to agree with Mr. Carlin. I think um, it is very difficult for um, many departments to uh, come up with the 5% match because when you're talking about departments that have maybe 40 or 50 volunteer firefighters on them and they're looking to um, uh, replace their SCBAs, you're talking about a, a cost of a, a quarter of a million dollars. And for a lot of those departments, they're... Um, their budget for the year is less than $50,000 and they have to maintain their equipment um, and provide all the services to their community out of that. So so moving that up to 15% would, I would say, definitely would affect the number of departments that would even apply. And then I think when we start losing departments that apply, we start losing our ability to um, have data on who's out there and who needs what. If they're not involved in the system, we don't have that information. And I think any time that we do anything that discourages departments from applying, we've cut our uh, ability to recognize what the true fire service needs for especially rural areas in this country are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, Mr. O'Connor, would you care to comment on that scenario that uh of in increasing and decreasing the matches uh, to respective sizes of departments? From our perspective, I think that uh, both the witnesses bring up very, very good points. It's, I don't think it's in anybody's intention or objective to try to reduce the number of grants. Uh, we honestly thought in, in crafting the United Fire Service position that the waiver for DHS to basically take into account economic exigencies would, in fact, provide an out to allow jurisdictions to address that. But when we were, I guess, contemplating this, we recognized that there are certain jurisdictions that are small in terms of population, but very, very well disposed financially. 
and our, our whole issue here was equity. So I think that, you know, we certainly would be willing to work with the community in trying to address that issue because it is not in anyone's attention to try to limit the number of Fire Act grants. Okay. Anyone else wishing to comment? I just concur with those comments from the IFC's perspective. We, we are not interested in raising that minimum threshold. We can actually live with the way it is for sure, but this was about making 15% more attractive, and, and likewise we thought the, uh, the waiver for economic hardship would deal with the ones that were in the most dire of need. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Lipinski, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Thank you, Member Smith, for, uh, for this hearing. I think that both the uh, fire and safer grant programs are uh, two vital tools for strengthening local fire departments nationwide. And although they've only, uh, only been in existence a relatively short amount of time, I think they've already demonstrated that their value, particularly in helping local departments fulfill emergency response duties that uh, obviously these days have expanded beyond firefighting. Uh, certainly, especially in the post 9-11 world, uh, there's been a, a big expansion what, uh, uh, what these local departments have, have, to, have to be prepared for. Uh, I'm concerned that many of the protections included in, in the bill for rural and volunteer departments, though, may have been more successful than expected, uh, resulting in suburban and urban departments combined only receiving 30% of the federal funding awarded. Uh, the fire grants authorizing legislation required that volunteer and combination departments receive funding in proportion to percentage of the U.S. population that they serve, about 55%. Uh, but from Mr. Connor's testimony, I understand a significantly larger percentage has been awarded to these departments since 2002. Now, under the 30-30-30 um, proposal, uh, wouldn't this still, and I'm throwing this question out to whoever wants to, uh, to address it, under that proposal, wouldn't this still result in more than 55%, the required 55% going towards volunteer and combination departments? Who wants to, aren't you still going to have that even under this 30-30-30 uh, proposal? I know Mr. O'Connor wants to jump in there. I thought maybe someone else wanted to, uh, but go ahead. No, I mean, we think so. We think that the, the uh, aspect of the combination departments, I mean, clearly uh, most of those, in our view, are generally departments that you're ha that's primarily volunteer where you hire two or three firefighters to uh, help with EMS, help with uh, being a paid driver. There's notable exceptions. My old department was a combination department that we had 3,000 volunteers and 1,000 career guys. But by and large, when you take a look at the combination, I, you know, I can't say this scientifically and I wouldn't purport to, but if you looked at this pot of 30-30-30 and you break it down, I think certainly that it would, it would hit the 55% the bogey. I just think that when you look at the, you know, the way the grants have been dispersed over the eight years, I don't think there's anybody that can legitimately look at it and say that, you know, the, the, the larger suburban and urbanized departments really haven't gotten you know, a fair share. And nobody wants to tilt the balance. We certainly are not looking to tilt the balance dramatically on the other side. We would just like equity, and uh, collectively we thought this was a fair way to address the issue. Chief Carriker. Thank you. Um, and I think that we're all interested in that. I don't think anybody at this panel um, feels any differently about making sure that we're doing the right thing for the right reason. That's what this is about. I think there's also other things that have to be considered in this, such as um, funding from other sources um, through USAR, through domestic preparedness, and there's a lot of other funding that's available to especially metro departments for specific um, challenges that they face and the types of things that, that they are definitely going to do. Um, uh, deal with uh, as opposed to rural departments. So I think that has an, uh, an effect on making sure that metro and suburban type departments do receive the funding that they um, justly deserve. But I don't think it always has to, that it, it doesn't always have to come from AFG. Uh, and I think that AFG is one of those programs that it, it is the only program that truly can deliver uh, training, equipment, um, and a 
and a capability for rural fire districts to perform at that baseline level. So when the metro departments, such as at, in the 9-11 inc uh, incident, um, are faced with those challenges, those rural departments and those volunteer departments can come in and help provide service to them as they've been affected with a baseline of equipment that's compatible, that's capable, and it's safe for those um, jurisdictions coming in to um, operate at that level with the metro departments. Was there something you want to add, Mr. Connor, or is there any? Go ahead. Well, just in general, I wouldn't take exception to the comments uh, about the, the, the scope of UASI, but as, as most folks in the fire service community know, specifically fire chiefs in, in, in those type of areas, is that UASI and Chisgap money generally doesn't filter down to the departments. It's not something that a fire department is able to identify their specific needs and make the application. And the chief is absolutely correct with respect to USAR, but I would submit that that is a federal function. Those 28 teams, which are chronically underfunded, and legitimately, we think that poses a threat to homeland security. But I think you have to look at that separately because that USAR training is not specifically geared to basic first response. It's geared to responding to a Katrina situation, uh, a Murrow building, a, a World Trade Center. But the, the chief's point is, is right. There is large pots of money available, but it's not necessarily directed to the fire service. This is also our pot of money, meaning you know, for all jurisdictions, specifically for fire service utilization. Thank you. See, my, my time's up. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Lipinski. Uh, Mr. O'Connor, I, I have, I guess, some of the same thoughts pertaining to the waivers um, or to the matching funds. I apologize to the matching funds and uh, making sure that we are able to fully take advantage of the funding that is available, recognizing that some fire districts or uh, fire departments have more trouble than others. Um, you testify the SAFER is in danger of failing if it isn't fixed now. And the American Recovery Act uh, waived matching requirements that the supplemental um, uh, allows departments to use the funding to retrain firefighters um, and to retain firefighters that may have otherwise been lost. Uh, given these major changes to the program, why is it still in danger of failing now? And what more should be done to make sure the program can continue to help local fire departments? I think you have to answer that in two phases. First off, the specifics to the current crisis that we're facing economically. Uh, and a lot of the steps we're taking first in the stimulus with the original wave on the safer grants for this fiscal year and next, coupled with what was just passed recently about two weeks ago in the supplemental, which affords the Secretary of DHS the authority to waive these requirements for a two-year period. Simply put, no one needs to be lectured or educated on, on the crisis nationwide. Small communities, much more so than large communities, if you take a look at the state of Massachusetts, Falls River, New Bedford, uh, Elyria, Ohio, small communities throughout Michigan are laying off firefighters in unprecedented numbers. Safer, the way it was currently constructed, was authorized in a period where the economy was a lot better. People did not envision firefighters being laid off. So it was originally authorized as a program to augment a local jurisdiction's hiring capability. We applaud this Congress, the Obama administration, and DHS for addressing that on a short-term basis. So that is with response to what was just done with respect to the supplemental and the stimulus. Separate and apart from that, when it comes to the reauthorization, under the current rules, as Chief Johnson very eloquently articulated, some of the requirements with respect to the $110,000, the way it's, it's tiered over five years, uh, the, the duration of the program really gives great pause to a lot of budget managers looking at it. We really can't prognosticate over a five-year period. So I think that you really have to keep it separate and apart from what was done in both the stimulus and the supplemental as it relates to what I'll call the tweak on SAFER to address the economic crisis as opposed to the reauthorization to make uh, uh, structural long-term changes to make SAFER a more appealing program for communities, hopefully, after we recover from this, this current crisis. Thank you. And Deputy Administrator Manning, how does FEMA create the criteria for fire protection safety grants, and how do the grants align with other fire protection research being performed across the federal government, such as the National Institute of Standards and Technology? And what is FEMA's view on the need to create centers of excellence for fire health and safety R&D? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we feel that those are some of the most important aspects to this, uh, the reduction in 
uh, loss of life and property and and the creation and the crafting of good guidance in the in the grant um, not just at non AFG but across all of the grant programs and across all of our preparedness policy can only come from from uh, establishment of uh, collection of good data the anal the analysis of good data um, and the, the creation of centers of excellence uh, is one way to, to accomplish that. Um, we, we would look forward as we go forward to uh, working with the committee to, uh, to identify how best to accomplish that. Chief Johnson. Mr. Chair Chairman, members of the committee, I think a, a, an example I'm experiencing right now about the value that a center of excellence could potentially bring to our, our profession is um, we have come a long ways in the fire service to bring residential fire sprinklers to the forefront, both in the fire code and other places. But when you try to implement it at the local level, one of the things that happens is you find out your local water provider, purveyors are uh, implementing system development charges, oftentimes between six and $10,000, because the larger water uh, line requirement to supply a fire sprinkler system based on engineering calculations, make them upsize their system. So they charge you for that in a system development charge. Now, we all know that a fire sprinkler is going to use far less water than four of my firefighters showing up on an engine company after the house is well involved. We're talking 18 gallons a minute. However, water purveyors have no empirical uh, evidence that shows that people will not utilize the full capacity of that water line installed for fire sprinklers to do things like add less stations on their sprinkler system for water in their yard. Therefore, they charge the system. When a homeowner is faced with $3,000 to install a sprinkler and $10,000 for a water line to supply that sprinkler, they say no. We don't have the science. And absent a research uh, center that conducts this kind of research and puts some of these things to bed that don't affect just a single department but affect our nation's fire service, without that, we'll actually uh, continue to perpetuate some of the barriers that uh, remain. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mr. Smith, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Manning, might you have an administrative position on the United Fire Services proposal for the AFG reauthorization, and particularly the proposals to introduce the set-asides based on department size and uh, the changing the matching requirements and the grant size? Uh, thank you. Uh, at, at this point, the, the administration uh, has not taken a position on uh, the details of, of the of reauthorization. We, we anticipate and appreciate the opportunity to work with the committee to do so as we go forward, but we haven't seen a, a formal re uh, recommendation. Um, we're aware of, of the discussion um, in the testimony this morning, uh, but we look forward to working with the committee uh, in identifying the potential impacts of, of any proposed uh, changes to the, re uh, to the to the statute as it re as it goes through reauthorization. Do you see a timeline for when you might be able to have a recommendation? Well, we, we're available to work with the committee at any time, um, and and would be uh, pleased to evaluate uh, any recommendations we may see from the committee against the numbers as we've uh, the, the historical numbers and and how they might have uh, might have rerun based on uh, new implementation guidance okay thank you also uh, the president's 2010 budget um, it actually cuts the assistance to firefighters grant the AFG program uh, by about 70 percent while doubling it and you know pushing money over to the safer program to hire new firefighters um, this is despite the fact uh, that more than $3 billion was requested for AFG while only $580 million was requested for the SAFER grants. Can you explain uh, these numbers? Um, well, Ranking Member Smith, the, the, the presidential request, is, uh, the, uh, the budget that came in from the administration was, uh, you know, as you were, the, the first time that there was a request from, from the administration to support these grants. Um, as we go forward, um, in, in out years, we anticipate and appreciate working with uh, with the with the Congress on the uh, the funding levels. Um, yeah, there, um, as was discussed earlier, there are a number of different funding uh, avenues through different grant programs. Um, this being uh, our first budget submission, you know, the, adjusting those grant programs to the right levels is something we are working on, and we'll continue to work on work closely with the committee and the appropriations committees on doing so in, in out years. Okay, I appreciate that. Anyone else wishing to comment on those? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, Chief Johnson, in your testimony, 
you include the importance of uh, how the larger fire departments should get funding as well. What can be done to, again, and, and I know what the question was asked but, uh, before, but with some of the smaller fire departments to ensure that they'll be able to get the adequate funding and uh, be able to benefit from some of the data that you uh, referenced earlier as well? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I think uh, particularly we're hearing from the large regional systems that have gone through the trouble on behalf of their local taxpayers to consolidate and regionalize their service. And in our particular area, were, uh, were we not consolidated, there, there would be 12 fire chiefs, 24 assistant fire chiefs, 12 fire training programs, and on and on and on. And by regionalizing, we've saved the taxpayers that kind of redundant overhead and allowed us to redirect that capacity to the street level. With that said, um, these departments, like in our case, if we were left alone, we would be eligible for 12 separate $1 million grants. And right now, we're eligible for a single $1 million grant. Um, our position is we would like to see the disincentive for cooperating and regionalizing removed, when actually you see language in there that promotes uh, regional efforts uh, and cooperation. So we just think this was a nuance that was overlooked, and we wanted to bring it to light. Thank you. And Chief Johnson, to go a step further as well, um, regarding local budgets and the importance of making sure that we're able to leverage those local budgets, uh, what are your thoughts there on the unintended consequences of uh, relying on federal funding to supplant that local funding? How can we leverage that local funding? And do you think that SAFER uh, should, should be change to allow for the retraining of firefighters as opposed to just for training of new firefighters? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The IFC's position is that we, we believe it was a good move uh, recognizing the current economic situation uh, to recognize the retention component of the SAFER grant. Um, we, we believe this really does, if you remove the barrier for making these long-term commitments, this really does create additional capacity, not only for career departments, but for volunteer departments who are also eligible for this. So we think it makes all the sense in the world. In terms of leveraging the local match, I think the, uh, as it relates to SAFER specifically, it's less of a barrier to come up with a match for SAFER than it is to say to yourselves, uh, for a $100,000 potential federal match, I'm willing to lock myself into five years of commitment, w knowing that if I hiccup in there, economically speaking, I've got to pay it all back. Uh, that's a commitment that most policymakers won't make. And one of the nuances at a local level is it is not uncommon that at state level and local level, boards are not allowed to bind future boards. So when you make a five-year commitment, you're outside the four-year uh, term of most local elected officials. So you actually run into statutory issues there. So we, we think that shortening this would provide a lot of incentives and remove the barrier. Thank you. And Mr. Uh, Carlin and Mr. Carragher, if you could just, again, talk about the importance of, uh, I think both of you have referenced how some of our smaller fire departments are just outdated and the importance of this funding to be able to assist you in building upon that local support as well. Mr. Carlin? Um, I guess uh, with the 30-30-30, um, just hearing about it, you know, a guy would have to look into it further, but if the panel that reviews the grants uh, busted up their peer reviews to uh, smaller people, looking at that 30% from small departments. Right now, if a small area puts in for a grant, my town is 600, uh, may have someone from Chicago, New York, and Miami looking at my grant, and how are they gonna understand my needs? At uh, the 30-30-30, if they bust up the peer reviews to that population category as well, uh, it may actually benefit the smaller areas as well. Chief? Thank you, sir. Um, I, I believe that there's, um, definitely room for um, improvement in um, how we apply these grant fundings. And I think it's very important, and certainly from the volunteer fire service, it's very important to um, a lot of the aspects of SAFER uh, continue. Uh, the recruitment and retention section of SAFER is extremely important, and it has no match. Um, and that, that is a, 
open for volunteer departments to put in for programs. And one of the biggest challenges for volunteer departments is finding somebody that's capable and has the time and can truly basically uh, build and implement a marketing program for um, finding new volunteers. So I think SAFER is an extremely important part of this grant process and the, and the program in general. But I think the things that, um, that need to happen in response to the economic um, situation of, the, of our country right now need to be short-term issues, not permanent issues uh, or not permanent solutions that, you know, it's five years from now um, we're looking at um, in recovery times when things are going good like they were five years ago when most of this was developed, that we're not um, inadvertently hurting how the, um, the program is implemented to the fire service. And, and I think that goes right into the AFG and taking money away from AFG and putting it in safer is that the, um, the economy is going to be, I, I think, somewhat proportionate to um, population. And the areas that uh, have a larger population are going to obviously um, recover faster than the rural areas. So I think that's even more important to, for us to remember that those any um, adjustments to the program we need to make um, need to be, um, be unfortunately short term, so that we can respond to the economic um, uh, situation in the country. But I think here today, this panel and your um, comments have proven to all of us that this is a, a program, it's a puzzle, it's a, it's a big picture. And each one of the sections of this program are vitally important and have a ripple effect to the other sections of the program. And that's why that funding and the reauthorization and the appropriate funding to all sections of this is so vitally important to the fire service. Thank you, Chief, thank you. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Smith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. O'Connor, um, can you, uh, in terms of the United Fire Service proposal, can you tell us a little bit, as quickly as you can, how that came about and, and who signed on to that? Discussions, I guess, started beginning recognizing that reauthorization was occurring this year. Uh, as you all know, there is an organization, uh, the Umbrella Group for the Fire Service, Congressional Fire Service Institute. Uh, a number of the participants in that, uh, including the IAFC, NFPA, the IAFF, uh, arson investigators, state fire training academy directors, and others, uh, began a series of conversations about uh, trying to address some of the issues that have been articulated in everyone's testimony. Thank you, and, and I appreciate uh, your willingness to come here today and, and explain some of this. I mean, clearly there's some disagreement here, uh, you know, among, among all of us of being friends, uh, let, let's say. And can, can we get everyone to sit down and, and discuss this and, and hopefully arrive? Contrary to what some people think, uh, we elected officials don't like controversy. Uh, um, we, we like it when uh, many, many, many parties uh, can get along and uh, and agree on things so that we can uh, kind of make things move quicker here. Um, do you think that's a, a thing that can be achieved? Well, speaking solely from the IFF perspective, I think that one of the things that has engendered some of the progress that the fire service has made is the fact that, by and large, we've had a great degree of cooperation among all components. Uh, you know, for people that have been in this town historically, uh, 15, 18 years ago, there was open warfare between the IAFC and the IAFF, and uh, happily that has abated, and, you know, we've worked very well together for, for a great number of years. The same applies with, at least in my view, the, the NVFC. I, you know, I, I think the Chief's comments and, and testimony today tracks pretty closely. Uh, I don't think there's a, a great deal of, of discrepancy and disagreement. I think everyone at this table has come from a firefighting background. We all recognize, uh, you know, Mr. Carlin is obviously a career firefighter and a volunteer. I started as a volunteer and ended as a career firefighter. So we can put him in charge. <laughs> but no, I, I think the short answer to your question is sure. I mean, everybody here is friends and everybody has the same objective. We might, it's like anything else, we might have disagreements on, you know, where the lines are ultimately cut. But as I testified earlier, I don't think that anybody objectively would look at it and not recognize it, you know, there needs to be some realignment. The question is, where do you cut the line? 
Okay, thank you, and I and I appreciate uh, Mr. Manning. Uh, I I know that there are many details of a president's budget. I, I guess um, I, I might hear you saying that the recommend or the the budget with the 70 percent reduction in the shifting of dollars might be a less than optimal uh, uh, idea, and maybe we could uh, steer away from that direction. Uh, am I correct in hearing you suggesting that maybe? Well, I. I, I we, of course, support fully the, the President's recommendation, and as we craft the out-year budgets, we will work with, uh, the, with the community to identify what the needs are and, and of course, working through our own process. But for this budget, you would like to see the 70 percent reduction and then shifting dollars elsewhere? Or is that? Well, for this budget, um, for this budget, we are primarily concerned with making the program as successful as possible and working with the budget that's provided to us by the Congress. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Manning, would you agree that some of the investment that was included on the waivers uh, to be able to provide more flexibility to fire departments across the country will assist in the upcoming budget cycle? The, the changes to the program that were made by the uh, supplemental and the, the uh, to the waiver authority is a uh, obviously has a possibility, has the potential to, to assist some communities. The application of that authority is, is uh, problematic. It can be difficult uh, as you try to find uniform um, criteria for the application. Uh, it's something that we'll have to look at closely. I, I, I believe that we can work with communities with the existing grant rules um, on, in the AFG. On the, the SAFER program, um, I believe that, that the, the waiver authority that was, uh, or the waiving of the, the, the match for the next two fiscal years will will certainly provide the assistance to communities throughout the country and again would be also highlight the importance of reauthoriz reauthorizing the safer act correct mr chairman absolutely yes um mr uh verone uh you talked a little bit about it, the importance of inspections and making sure that we're um being responsible in that manner if you could touch upon the importance of that, and especially as we're looking at commercial properties, residential prop properties, and what more we could do there. And also, if you could highlight the importance of uh, what are the most effective programs in a few of these areas. Well, in terms of inspections, uh, it seems like one of the first things that gets cut in economic times is, the, is activities in the Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, w you know, one of the first things to go are the inspections, and uh, it, it's it's vitally important that the the uh, inspections continue, and we we would like to see some additional um, consideration through the AFG uh, to help support some of the uh, fire prevention activities that would help support those uh, th those inspection activities. Thank you very much. And I have no further questions, Mr. Smith. Okay. With that being said, I want to thank you all for appearing before the committee this afternoon. Um, the record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for answers to any follow-up questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. Uh, with that, the witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>